Why don't we go ahead and get started? Welcome to Ames. Welcome to the Gateway. Welcome to our Human Factors Workshop. We did, uh, I'm Sandra Larson. I'm the Research and Technology Bureau Director at the Department of Transportation here in Ames. And I really appreciate uh, your attendance and your participation today. The last time we had a Human Factors Workshop was in 2005. And we have a formal report from that. Uh, we do have copies of that report. Uh, you can get them certainly electronically easily from us. But we do have uh, printed copies if you have not seen that or want to review that. We will have another report from this day's sessions. We will include all the ideas that are shared today on the needs that we have in research in this area. But also we will um, have that report electronically. We will share that nationally. I have no doubt it will go beyond the borders of the United States also. We have a diverse group here today. I hope you get around and you have an opportunity to meet a lot of new people and hear a lot of new ideas. We will have an opening session where we kind of set the stage for what we're looking at here. I think uh, very easily the best thing that I can tell you is we are looking to identify needs for research and human factors as related to transportation. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Mark Lowe is our Motor Vehicle Division Director. And really, this workshop came uh, about as a conversation between Mark and his staff and uh, the staff in the Research Bureau. So here's Mark Lowe. Um, Sandra and Shashi asked me to talk a little bit about uh, context and objectives. Uh, and uh, I thought, you know, you know what, what is the context of what we're here? And I'm glad to hear Sandra mention the diversity of the group because, um, you know, I'm, I've only been motor vehicle direct director uh, for about six months, a little over six months. And uh, before that, I was general counsel for the DOT uh, for about a year. And before that, uh, I was in private practice as an attorney for, uh, for 15 years. And you know, what kind of context do we bring to this with that diverse group? I have one perspective from that. I think you folks have a lot of other perspectives. We all have different perspectives to share from the diversity that we have. So. Um, from, from that, I think what we're trying to do is get that sharing going and, and, uh, and, and cross-reference our diversity and our experiences and perspectives and that kind of thing. So getting back to uh, just sharing some of my perspective, you know, it's, it's really interesting to me when people talk about distracted driving and, and it's been extremely, um, uh, there's been a lot of attention paid to it in, in the last couple of years. But when I look back at the lawsuits that we've handled, the accidents we've handled, Distracted driving is so much a part of all of those, all of the rear-end collisions and the, you know, the reasons that somebody didn't see something that was plainly in front of them. Although most people won't admit it, there was some factor of distracted driving there. It was always interesting to me when somebody would run right into something that was in, in plain sight of them. Um, if you were to ask them in deposition what they were doing, their hands were on the wheel exactly as they were told. They were always driving within speed limit. The radio wasn't on. They were never eating anything. They didn't have anything in their hands. They weren't on a cell phone. They didn't have a soda. We know those things aren't true. So distracted driving is all around us. Um, you know, some of the things we talk about now with cell phones and texts, I think, are more ubiquitous. They're more pressing. They're, they're more clearly uh, factors of, dis of, of distracted driving. But but certainly what we've seen is that distracted driving has been a continuous thing, you know, at least in the 15 years that I was doing personal injury litigation. But I looked at our agenda today and you know, we looked at older drivers, younger drivers, uh, drinking drivers, people who've exhibited uh, poor judgment. We certainly saw all of those things uh, on a continual basis. Um, well, you can see from all of these things how these highway safety issues affect people personally and they affect the drivers and they affect their independence, they affect the lives and property of others. Um, they affect really our whole social well-being because all of these folks who've been injured and damaged all had opportunities to be uh, productive and healthy uh, persons. So I think the real charge is, you know, all of us are affecting and improving these things and what a, what a great and important thing that is and what a reason to get charged up about what we're doing today. So thank you very much. And at this time, I'm going to turn things over to Shashi. Good morning. Thank you, Mark and Sandra. I'm Shashi Dambishan, uh, Director of Intrans. I just wanted to 
say, point out a few things, say a few comments, and then uh, give you some things about the program today. Uh, first of all, welcome on behalf of uh, the Iowa State University and the Institute for Transportation, we are now known as INTRANS, <laughs> formerly known as CTRI. And we appreciate all of you making the time, giving up uh, a lot of your time to be here with us to address this important topic, as Mark just said, uh, to address ways in which we can enhance safety on roadways, looking at it from a human factors perspective, and what might be research opportunities and challenges and how might we go about addressing them. That's the ultimate outcome that we're looking for at the end of the day today. Dan is the director of the Human Factors and Vehicle Safety uh, Research Program at the University of Iowa. He has worked on a number of projects related to human uh, factors and safety, with a particular emphasis on teen drivers, their behaviors, and safety. Among these are uh, some pool fund projects that involve several states, and one of the more uh, recent projects is on uh, uh, drivers who are 14 or 15 years of age uh, who operate motor vehicles. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Dan. Thank you so much, Dan, for... So what I'm going to talk about uh, today is some of our teen driving work, which I think is very relevant to what we're going to be talking about today. Teen driving is really... Uh, a pretty phenomenal area to study. We've had some pretty interesting results. It's not often that researchers actually get to put cameras and microphones into cars of teenagers to really understand what makes them tick, how they develop their skills or not uh, when they drive. And one of the things that's really interesting about this phenomenon, about how many kids are killed every year in the U.S., about 5,000 kids are killed uh, driving in cars and around cars. That's, it's the most dangerous thing that we allow our kids to do, uh, but somehow it sort of falls below the radar in terms of really understanding what those dangers are all about. And I think what's very frustrating for us that study this kind of, uh, these kind of this population is that every crash that we uh, do a case study on, every crash that we review in our own uh, video files, you see causes. And they are not accidents by any means at all. And one of the things I'd like you to erase from your memory banks is the term accidents uh, in, any in, in any case. There are crashes and all of these have causes. And I think your job today is to try to get at reducing those causes of those crashes. If we can just eliminate one or two of those factors, we can prevent that crash altogether. In terms of what teen crash causes are about, uh, they have a big, big, uh, big trouble in terms of uh, inexperience with vehicle control. They don't get a lot of practice. By the time uh, they hit the roads, they sometimes only have 10 or 20 hours of driving experience. Uh, some parents don't really have time to spend with them. They rely on driver training uh, to get that time behind the wheel. And then once out there, they have a, a poor ability to anticipate and ident identify hazards out in the field. And then they're very vulnerable to peer influence and uh, are willing to take risks in situations that many of us would never do. And then this is really exacerbated by uh, a poor understanding of their own abilities relative to the task demands. And I think what's very unique about this generation is that they have much more information that's being thrown at them now than we did a generation ago in learning how to drive when we were as equally as deadly. But now we have cell phones and texting in particular uh, social communication networks that are constantly being updated and read while they're driving, iPods uh, and so forth, very much pervasive. And I think exposure is a critical element for you all to think about today as you go through your focus groups. Uh, Nielsen just released a report last month that showed that the average 16-year-old has 2,800 text message and cell phone interactions per month. Uh, that is unbelievable. So one of the things that we also face is a changing driving environment. Uh, in rural states like Iowa, we've consolidated many schools. Uh, 30 years ago, we had a number of uh, schools spread out in a county. Now we consolidate into one feeder school, which means more driving and more exposure. Again, more exposure to high-speed roadways, more ex exposure to gravel, gravel roads, getting to school. 
in uh, the study we did at Clear Creek Amana High School two years ago in Tiffin, Iowa, which is a rural school, the average daily drive uh, of each of our drivers was 40 miles a day. Uh, so stunning exposure uh, out there. Among the urban and suburban drivers, the complexity of the intra-city freeway networks in terms of merging on, merging off, uh, very complex, uh, quick action required type driving uh, is out there, and that's very different. Uh, and again, a generation ago, we had you know one major freeway coming through town, a few major entrance and exits, and uh, largely uh, suburban driving was done on lower class streets. And again, texting and cell phone communication uh, is very much alive uh, in that context. So if you imagine a, a, a teenager is sending 100 text messages a day, sending and receiving 100 messages a day, the amount of time out of class time they have is relegated really to the time they are in the car. So it's uh, pretty intense. So some of the research, too, that we're looking at uh, that's quite compelling is that we see that the more passengers on board a car, the high, higher probability of a crash. If you get five or six kids in a car, you have a, 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 an enormous uh, confluence of, of issues that are going to come together and likely result in some kind of incident or crash. Most crashes occur before midnight, between 9 and midnight. That's when most kids are out on the road. While we see a lot of fatalities after midnight, most crashes are occurring between 9 and midnight. And the first six months is clearly the most dangerous among this population. But the good news is that, is that enhanced graduated driver's licensing programs uh, are showing very positive results. North Carolina, uh, last year Kansas just enhanced theirs in, in a, a very nice program. And we hope this year we will be able to enhance Iowa's uh, GDL system, and, and we're ready this time. We have lots more data uh, under arms that we're going to march into uh, Des Moines and present that I think will be even more compelling than the last time we were able to go and visit. So one thing I want to kind of share with you briefly here today is one technology that we think uh, is part of the answer. Uh, and one of the things that we want to do is mentor kids, have parents be able to mentor their kids after they began independent licensing. There are a number of monitoring technologies out there, GPS tracking systems, GPS fences, uh, thing, systems that will uh, let you know where your, your, your child is at any moment of the day, how fast they're going, all those things. But we want to concentrate on technologies that help them learn how to drive better. And one of those uh, technologies is called event triggered video. Because in our role, uh, and frequently at, in the university, we're placed in sort of the chain of product design. And we know that successful design uh, requires high user acceptance. So on the front end of these kinds of projects, we want to make sure that that's something that, that's not going to hold up implementation later on. Uh, and in this case, uh, the intervention itself is more in, in important than the technology. So, and then finally, we want to really enhance learning for the long term. So event-triggered video gives us an additional element of context of when a safety error occurs. And this is really important. If you have a black box, there is no context. And uh, so we know that uh, teenagers are pretty good at self-rationalizing. They tell their parents, well, gee, everybody does that. I had to go 80 miles an hour because that's how fast the traffic was going. Uh, they can come up with uh, all sorts of things. But we can provide teachable moments, and what we call sort of the good, the bad, and you almost died. Now, there are several different uh, uh, video rent recorders out there, uh, made by Smart Drive, DriveCam, and VisionCam. We've been working with DriveCam for several years and have developed a pretty good partnership. Uh, they essentially, uh, these type of systems record in your car, they're on, I should say not record, they're on 24 hours a day, even while they're sitting in your garage, but they don't record until you have an exceedance, and that is an abrupt braking or steering event that occurs. Then it goes back in time, much like you, you can with your TiVo or digital video recorder, and take a look at what actually caused that event. The, the, the driver then gets a blinking light that says, the system has recorded an event, and then that light will usually stay red until it's downloaded. 
Now, uh, one of the, the next generation systems that we're using is a cellular download, whereas before we were using wireless systems in the parking lots of, of high schools. And uh, now we are also able to capture exact location, lat long, and speed uh, during the event. And this is quite exciting, and I'm not sure how well this is going to show up, but uh, what essentially we see is the, a view inside the vehicle, what you see there on the left. Uh, you can see our drivers here, perhaps not from the back of the room, are not wearing their safety belts. We can see the road ahead, and uh, we can then plot the actual acceleration of the vehicle. That's what you see, the red and, and blue. Uh, then we can provide a narrative of what caused the event. And then what we see here, <coughs> we actually know the exact speed uh, across the 12-second uh, event. We get 12 seconds of video. Uh, eight seconds before and four seconds after the triggering event. And we have the latitude and longitude of that as well. And so adding additional context, we actually now can place this uh, as automatically as presented the exact location of that trigger. And those of you that are roadway designers, this really becomes uh, a really interesting context of where <laughs> errors occur. So if this one young woman is about to take uh, a sharp curve to the left and is going too fast, uh, we can go back and take a look at what the roadway markings are about, what the shoulders are about. There's a lot of really interesting contextual information that's added, added to this. Uh, to give you an example of what uh, <coughs> some of these events look like, some of these are quite graphic, but they're also very instructive. So what we see in uh, these data is that we put uh, these systems in the car uh, for about a year in our previous studies. For the first uh, six or eight weeks or so, they drive without any feedback at all. They don't get a blinking light or anything. We just take a look at characterizing their driving. And after that six or eight week period, we turn on the feedback, and that is the form of the blinking light when it triggers, and we send home a weekly report card that shows how many events they triggered relative to their peer group. So immediately the parent and the teen can see where they fit among their teens. We also show how often they have their safety belt on during these events, uh, as well as passenger safety belt uh, as well. Now the next study that we're doing is called the Million Mile Study, which is a group of 14-year-old drivers, 14 and a half-year-old drivers, school permit uh, operators here in Iowa. Uh, we have the first control condition uh, that we've ever done, and that means that uh, one group will have the system and get the feedback every week, and the other group gets no feedback at all during the entire project. So we can really take a look at maturation effects over the course of the, the six months that they're in the car, and then we're also looking at a group, uh, another cohort of 16-year-olds, newly, newly, newly licensed 16-year-olds that are both have not had the school permit and ones that have had that school permit as well. So we'll have 90 uh, drivers in that in that design, again split by a uh, control group. <clears throat> so right now we have 10 systems installed. Uh, we're in, we're installing 10 more in November and December. Uh, we're very much uh, in the data processing and coding and, and starting our weekly reports for that project. Uh, we're also uh, looking for funding actually as we speak to look at doing what we want to call the 100 crash study. Uh, we have 50 crashes right now that we've been able to obtain to really take care, take, take a very detailed look at what all the different crash causes are uh, among the videos, the, some of those that I shared here earlier. Uh, we'd like to uh, develop an interdisciplinary team uh, to code these from traumatology folks to roadway engineers, uh, traffic engineers, try to really put together a comprehensive team because every specialty looks at these videos and they see something different. One of the things that uh, we do in, in teaching human factors engineering that's always a great challenge, and you've, you've no doubt come across many products that you just cannot figure out how they were ever designed. And so we have a saying in human factors, and that is, know thy user, and you are not thy user. 
And uh, what that is essentially is try to understand why people, how other people operate, not yourselves, and I'm not saying you in particular, but this is a, uh, an important thing to think about uh, as you think about other ideas. Because uh, I think we're really blessed with a, a group of very smart, innovative people today. And uh, we're going to be able to come up with some interesting outcomes. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Tom Welch. Uh, for those of you who have the opportunity to travel outside Iowa and participate in these kinds of discussions, you will quickly learn we are blessed to have Tom Welch working in the Iowa DOT here. Thank you, Tom. Uh, it reinforces what some of this national study has been showing on causation of crashes. Um, rarely is the roadway a contributing factor or even a major factor on fatal crashes. The driver behavior is a major factor in almost two-thirds of all fatal crashes. It is a contributing factor over 90% of the fatal crashes. Uh, the roadway is a major factor in less than 5%, a contributing factor you know, in a very, very small percentage. So the challenge to us engineers is what can we do? And we could build straight, flat roadways in Iowa with perfect sight distances, and there'd still be a high number of the fatalities that are occurring in Iowa continuing to occur. Uh, so what we try to do in our profession is to provide a forgiving environment. It is inevitable that there's going to be bad judgment, there's going to be driver error, and what we're going to try to do in our profession, the best that we can do in our profession, is to provide that forgiving environment so that you do make that mistake that you hopefully can recover uh, from that. So I'm just going to show you some of the more recent uh, innovative engineering strategies. I could talk here for an hour about all the different engineering strategies we could do and have done, but things that are beginning more popular across the country that other states have taken the lead on or discovered and we're implementing here in, uh, in the other states. Uh, as you're beginning to see in Iowa, and if you've been to Missouri, you've seen hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles of cable median. More distracted drivers, more people going out in those winter weather conditions and bad conditions, assisting that they can drive and going off of the medians and going across the medians and causing head-on crashes and fatalities. Distracted driving, we're going to see much more of that. We're just getting the touch of the iceberg. That generation of drivers who insisted and are addicted to text messaging is just entering our driving environment. And we're going to see a dramatic increase, I think, in cross-center line head-on crashes. States such as Michigan and Missouri are saying we're not waiting. Michigan's DOT's chief engineers told all the district engineers, you shall install center line rumble strips on every two-lane highway in the state of Michigan, regardless of the pavement condition. I don't care what it does to that center line joint within the next two years. Uh, Missouri has put in thousands of miles of this. Uh, we've put in several miles in Iowa. We will be putting in more miles, more driven by by a, a crash history at this point. But I think you'll see this being a very common application, again, to try to mitigate that distracted driving issue that is out there. We know that not only younger drivers, but drivers my age and older have a very high difficulty of crossing and making left-hand turns at high-speed multi-lane roadways, the expressway systems. Iowa is one of 20 states that's built hundreds and hundreds of miles of roadways that look like interstates except without the interchanges. North Carolina, Maryland's taken the lead on this, is building what was called J-turns that prohibit you from going straight across or making a left turn. It makes you to make a right turn, go down and make a U-turn through the median and come back and cross into the side road or continue off to your left. Well over 90% effective in reducing all crashes. Very, very controversial. You think roundabouts are controversial. Try to go out in the public in Iowa and explain we're going to build a J-turn. The shoulder, paved shoulders, you know, have been out there for a long time. We started putting rumble strips out on the interstates, saw how they're very effective, other states did. Now the other states are applying that uh, on all the two-lane roadways, more of the two-lane roadways, including Iowa, is finally putting paved shoulders. I think we're the last state in the country to put in paved shoulders. But again, you see in the center there, what Missouri did is, Mississippi actually took the one step further. Mississippi, they get a lot of rain. When you get rain, the rain covers the pavement marking. Now, pavement marking is consistent of not only paint, but glass beads. And it is with your headlights that reflect off that glass bead that makes that uh, pavement marking really show up at night. You put water over that little bit of rain, you don't get that reflectivity, and you end up driving in a black hole, and you've paved the shoulders, you've paved the roadway all black. Uh, you, you essentially are driving in a black hole oftentimes. So Mississippi came up with the idea, 
Let's move the center line, edge line to the rumble strip, paints the vertical force, the water can't uh, hide that and you get very positive guidance at night uh, in that area. And what's key is all these things we're talking about here are very relatively low cost. You start doing system wide. Um, Non-engineering, uh, we've had great success in enforcing seat belts, getting great uh, high percentage of seat belt use in the daytime, tremendously drops off at nighttime. So what states have been doing, including Iowa Department of Public Safety, has been increasing our nighttime seat belt enforcement. We need to try to convey to the drivers that there is more risk to this behavior than what they've been seeing in the past, and it's getting very challenging with reduction enforcement offices that are out there. That, you know, that's the primary challenge we have as professions is the unfortunate thing is that drivers perceive there's greater reward in all this behavior than there is greater risk. And if we don't change that thought process, it's going to be very difficult uh, to do so. The other thing we did in a non-injury perspective is when we go out and look at safety challenges, we have not in the past done a very good job of trying to address driver behavior and getting input from the drivers. What the Federal Highway Administration has been encouraging the states to do is, is to make your studies multidisciplinary, have multidisciplinary people out on your road safety reviews, not just engineers. Uh, another innovative uh, strategy, again, very low cost solution that the Federal Highway Administration is promoting is when we're resurfacing the roadway, building the roadway, Instead of having a vertical drop, even though you're going to have gravel up there and you know that gravel is going to wear off and have an edge drop, put a small slope on the edge of that roadway that's recoverable, that is forgivable. And that's what we're seeing with all these things, is trying to provide a forgiving environment. Our chief engineer is leaning towards uh, making this a standard in Iowa. I believe that's the direction he's given our, our, our offices. And uh, we'll be probably the first in the country to do this system-wide on the edge of our shoulders. And other states have been doing this. So those are just some of the you know, new things that are out there, uh, trying to address it, and uh, again, I, I challenge you to, we've really got to look at how do, how do we convey through education and experiences to these drivers that their behavior is far greater, riskier than what they feel it is, and it's more riskier than the war that they perceive they're going to get themselves into. So, thank you. I would like to welcome next Essie Wagner uh, with NHTSA, a wonderful person. I hope you all get a chance to meet with her today. She has a lot of experience and um, just a good friend. Um, really, uh, my, my topic today, what I was asked to talk about, is the national perspectives. On, on safety and, and how it works. And I was like, well, how about we just talk about what I do more often? Um, and that's really try to translate research into something useful. Um, before I go on, though, I do want to note Iowa's leadership uh, on all of these traffic safety issues. Uh, people like Kim, people like Tom, have been out there doing work internationally and, and really making Iowa look great uh, in the rest of the world, you know, creating the flexible license renewal policies. That's a national model. Other states are saying, wow, you can do that? You can go out and, and give people licenses just for their local areas? Okay, we'll do that. You know, adopting the roadway design guidelines. Those are things that even, you know, Australia says, wow, I was doing that? Okay, we can do it too. Um, you're really, you're fostering an environment where you have creative people doing creative things to help the rest of the community, and you're not, you're exporting the ideas, but you're not exporting the people. And so I think that's really to be commended, so thank you for that. Um, before I go on into talking about older driver stuff, I need to introduce NHTSA, which is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I don't know if you're familiar with us. Uh, we're the people who uh, our mission is to save lives and prevent injuries on, from crashes in our, on our nation's roads. It's a, a pretty straightforward kind of thing. It's very easy to, to understand it and to get behind it. I mean, how can you be against saving lives? You can't. Um, and we get a progress report every day when we open up the newspaper. Like, oh, no, not this one. And we go out every day and we're trying to do better. We're trying to save those lives. We're also re responsible for vehicle safety standards 
uh, things like you know getting the airbags into cars uh, all those years ago. Uh, we're responsible for CAFE standards, the corporate average fuel economy. We did the, the CARS program, uh, you know, cash for clunkers, as everybody knows it as. And we also manage the, the FARS database, which is the fatality analysis reporting system, and uh, a lot of the other crash databases. So things that you probably use in your daily work uh, are things that we have a hand in. So with regard to older drivers, we've had a program in place for 20 years now, uh, mostly with research. A lot of that research was done here in Iowa um, at the, the old Iowa driving simulator and what uh, eventually grew up to be NADS, um, as well as other researchers along and around in the state here. The reason that we got behind doing this kind of research is because we were sort of looking into the crystal ball of the future saying, oh gosh, those baby boomers, in 20 years, they're going to be older drivers. We have to do something to address this issue. We have to get them off the road. Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Um, and then through doing our research, we realized that's not going to be effective. <laughs> it's going to get a lot of people hating us. And, and, and by the way, it's not necessarily going to be the right thing to do. There are so many people who are, are capable of driving safely. So why don't we try to focus on the people <coughs> who are at risk? So that was sort of where the research led us in the way. So we had these population pressures. Uh, we also have, in addition to the, the baby boomers changing, we, all, we saw that older people were living longer and they were living healthier lives. So they're going to be out there on the roads. So we had that. We also saw there were some pressures, uh, as we call it, um, from uh, exposure. They're out there driving more, particularly the baby boomers. The women are going to be driving so much more than the earlier cohorts, like the older drivers where the women were sitting in the passenger seat and the men were in the driver's seat. Baby boomers, uh -uh. <laughs> we're not doing that. We're going to be driving ourselves. So we had to make sure that we were addressing those kinds of issues. And then the, the last pressure that we have to address is, is that frailty pressure. There's nothing really that we can do to change the individual's ability to recover or withstand the crash forces. So we have to make the, the vehicle itself safer and we have to make sure that that crash doesn't happen in the first place. So those are the kinds of things that, we, uh, that shaped us and are shaped our thinking when we decided to uh, set our program, our program goal, as to hold the line on fatalities. We knew that there were going to be things that were going to be pushing those numbers up, but we decided that we had to make sure that they stayed at least level and hopefully would go down. We'll see in, uh, I guess it's 13 months, whether or not all our hard work uh, has really been effective <laughs> when, when the baby boomers do start turning 65. But We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Now, in 2001, I said part of what I do is, is translate uh, research. We did all this research, research, research. And I translate that into something useful. And it's really harder than you would think. It's like, well, OK. You know, it's like I can take that report and take it off the shelf and say, OK, everybody do this. And, and then having people hear me is really not easy. Um, what we decided to do is look to um, other people that have a, a common mission with us. So for the older driver program, we looked at uh, to partners such as the American Medical Association, uh, where we developed the Physician's Guide for, so for, for Assessing and Counseling Older Drivers. Uh, what we saw is we want to um, help physicians <coughs> counsel their, their patients and physicians were already identified as being important, um, legitimate, and listened to sources for good traffic safety information, but they had no idea what to say. And so what we did together is we came up with this guide. We're about to come out later on. It'll be early next year for a revised version of the Physician's Guide, if you're familiar with that. <coughs> Um, we've also established partnerships with the American 
Association on Aging and the American uh, Occupational Therapy Association. Um, different people who have common mission to save lives and to educate their, their users on how to help people save lives and to ha continue staying out there and being active and involved in the community, but uh, doing it safely. So the important thing to remember is that we always, always, always have a foundation in research. Research tells us where to go. Uh, we can't, you know, we're like, oh yeah, let's go ahead and, and do a program on X. And no, we can't do that. We have to, to have some evidence basis for what we're doing. There's a lot of what Dan was talking about there. Um, one of the, the programs, one of the projects, and this is what uh, Kim alluded to that we worked together on for forever, was uh, this right here, the Driver Fitness Medical Guidelines, which just came out. It says September, but it was October 2nd. I know because I was jumping up and down when this came out. We started working with AMVA, which is the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators. Um, we've been working with them for years anyhow, um, because licensing has something to do with traffic safety, we think. We've always thought that. Um, also, at the same time, our research was suggesting that our, it's not necessarily age, that it's abilities, it's functional ability that makes a person safe or unsafe. I mean, you know, we have, we, we know there are people at age 50 that have early stage dementia. We also know that there are people who are in their 80s who are running marathons. So we know it's not age, we know it's function. So yeah, six years ago we started this project. And we, and it's sort of like herding cats, um, <laughs> getting, getting the physicians to, to understand licensing, getting licensing to understand uh, what, the, what the doctors were having to say. And we came up with an evidence-based guide for making licensing decisions. It's really a very uh, useful tool. Um, it has information on how you have to, as a, as a DMV administrator, how you have to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. It sounds really benign, but it's really critically important um, I'm sure you <laughs> understand completely. You don't want to have people uh, arguing with you over what you're doing. You want to actually have to show them, uh, have to have them demonstrate that they are safe as drivers. Seems reasonable in terms of that. And we learned through the process that the, those are the ways that we have to do it. Um, it has information for the driver licensing administrators on making um, outreach and communications with the other people, you know, people with the, you know, MS, people with uh, diabetes, people with dementia. Um, do outreach for, for those individuals. They, these are the things that we expect of you, um, also for their for the physicians. So, so if you make a referral to us, this is what we're going to need to have from you. The other thing that it includes um, is sort of the dissenting opinions. Um, it, you know, we, you, you try to come to consensus on these things. Um, but sometimes people just aren't going to come to an agreement on why you think you should be doing something. And in particular, um, this uh, has some, uh, a, a, uh, an appendix in here um, describing the dissent from the American Diabetes Association saying they think it should be this way, then the, the DMV people say no, and the DMV and the physician people say no, it should be this way. This sort of tells you as the DMV people what to expect if, if you decide to make these, uh, these ch uh, recommended changes. Um, so that it gives you a whole picture of, you know, you could just say yes, I can do this, I can change the world, but it's really not easy to do. And this will give you those steps. And of course, you know, just having this out on somebody's shelf is not going to save one life. Uh, what we have to do and what we're going to do in the, in the coming years is promote the use, encourage states like Iowa and all the others as well to go ahead and adopt this. To, to yes, say, okay, there is evidence for making this kind of policy change and let's go ahead and do it. So similar efforts uh, have gone through, um, you know, we've gone through similar efforts, excuse me, 
to, to develop uh, activities on transitioning from driving. That was something that was talked about earlier. Um, you know, we call it transitioning. Some people call it driving retirement. Um, what I really like to think of it is you know, just moving over into the passenger seat because most of your trips uh, for older people are going to be in cars. They're not going to be jumping on the paratransit because in places around here there's not necessarily going to be the paratransit. Um, they're going to get a ride from the neighbor. They're going to get a ride from the adult, uh, adult child, most likely the daughter. Um, as I said earlier, when we started out this business, we really were saying, well, how are we going to get them off the road? And no, it's not going to work. Through our research, through our, our um, activities and partnerships, we came to realize that no, we have to do this this way. Most people are going to be fine and safe for most of their lives, really. It's just when you get to the end, when, when the functional abilities change, when functional abilities deteriorate, that you have to make those transitions, make those decisions to, to stop driving. And so we worked with the American Society on Aging to develop the Driving Transitions Education. It's really for uh, geriatric social workers or anybody who works with older people or their families one-on-one -on, -one, um, on, on making, how do, you, how do you go through the process? Or do you just say, okay, your driving career is over, sorry, give me the keys. No, it, it's not gonna work that way. It's, it tells you how to go through, okay, you know, let, let's look at the driving, let's, where do they go? What do they need to do? Where do they uh, feel their, their most value in driving? And how do you make sure that they maintain that value? So, um, it's a very, I love this, this, uh, this education tool. Um, I have a couple copies here as well, so if you do have questions about it afterwards, please, please do let me know. Um, and again, it's, it's that whole research background that helped us get the credibility to make these basic, simple recommendations. Now, now that we've gotten these tools out, um, our aim is really to, to go into some of the harder issues. Um, where our future has us going is going to be more into this transitions world and more into the dementia world. Um, because, one, there's really probably inadequate research in those areas. But there's also, those are the areas that are the thorniest, the things that the families and judiciary and licensing have the most challenges facing. They don't understand how to do it, to, so it's easy. It, I don't think it's ever going to be easy, uh, particularly with dementia. Because there are good days and bad days, and there are days where, where people just, uh, you know, they suddenly drop off the cliff for, for cognitive function. And, and since driver licensing only sees people, what, every year if they're on a, a short cycle, you know, that's 364 other days that this person could be out there driving. And, and that can't rest on the shoulders of, of licensing. It needs to rest on the shoulders of, of families. It needs to go on to physicians and other uh, social services people, as well as on law enforcement as our, our last resort. Uh, they need to understand how to act and how to, how to uh, change the behavior of that individual who's putting others at risk. Now, in terms of, of going forward with today's work, um, I want you to think about um, where are the gaps? Because these are the ways that we go about things at, at, at NHTSA on the national level too. Where are the gaps? What are we missing? What can we do? What's being done elsewhere? that we can sort of tweak and make our own. Um, those are all good, and then like I said, our predictions are, are gonna either come true or uh, we're going to uh, have to tr change things around when, when uh, the baby boomers do start turning 65 next year. But, uh, so, but, you know, just what we have to do is, is first is to look to the evidence. Um, and that's, you know, based on the this, this stuff that's in the back chapters of, of, uh, of this guide that we have, the medical guidelines, there's a lot in there. It says, okay, what other things can we research? Where, where, the, where is the evidence kind of dicey? 
kind of dodgy. See what you can do to, to make that better. Look where others aren't necessarily looking. What other rocks can you pull up? Um, in terms of older drivers, I mean, vision, I mean, we all know it's important, but there's not really any evidence that says what vision is, imp you know, what level of vision is, is unsafe and what is safe. It, it, is, it astounds me to realize that. Uh, Parkinson's disease is another issue that we need to look at a little more closely. The next thing I, I really want you to do, in particular today, is make connections. I think everybody has said this, you know, all the speakers this morning. Talk to other people. We're stronger and we make better decisions when we have other voices involved. And, and you know, for example, with, this, uh, with the, the, the driver fitness, we would never have been able to come up with as good a quality report if we hadn't had some of those um, really challenging people from Canada. <laughs> we'll talk about. Um, they were, oh gosh, I love them to death, but oh, they were they were fun. Um, and lastly, <laughs> um, I, I as as a make something useful person, um, I want you I want you to encourage theft and the law enforcement people can go like that. Um, just don't don't go reinventing the wheel. Don't do something that's exactly like what they're doing over in. Uh, Missouri or, or you know, Canada or something, you know, at the same time that they're doing it. Look at what they're doing, get the results and say, okay, now it's mine. I'm going to make this an Iowa thing or wherever it is that you're actually from. Take it back, but, you know, thieving is good. And, and the academics will say, oh, no, no, we can't do, no, this is, this is, uh, this is actually implementation, so you get to steal. Um, and besides, it's easier. So. Uh, with that, I do want to thank you, and uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to a productive meeting. So thank you. While I was li listening to this morning's speakers, one thing stood out is the passion for working in this area. You really can make a difference. You all know that. That's why you're here. Uh, look forward to uh, looking at the results and listening in and participating in the breakout session. The rest of the day is yours. Please go forth and do good things. Thank you.